pedazo. Hello. Hi I'm Ron Miscavige, and this is Life After Scientology. And of course, that music you heard is uh, my song from the album I did in 1974 called Barnum and Gumbo. <laughs> now, this morning, and before we get into it, I just want to do a little business, and that is this. Uh, there's a thing we have called Patreon, which is a way that you can contribute to the ongoingness of this show. And uh, if any of you would like to join this and help support this activity, I'd appreciate it very much. For the, whatever you want to contribute, it could be two dollars, it could be a hundred dollars, but uh, it you turn immediately from a spectator into a participant. And if you want to do that, just go on to my website, which is therealronmiscavige.com, and you can see how to get on it there. Mm. But now, getting down to business, I have a guest on this morning. That story, her story, borders on the unbelievable in my mind. I mean, this little girl actually escaped death. I'm talking about a little girl in Nazi Germany through a stroke of luck by a good friend who happened to pay a bribe to a Nazi soldier and didn't put her on the train that would have taken her to the gas chambers. She's a writer. She's an investigative reporter. And uh, she wrote the first, I think it was the first book, exposing Scientology called the scandal of Scientology. And anyway, instead of a lot more words, let's get right into it. Please welcome Paulette Cooper. Good Hello. morning, Paulette. Hi. Well, there you go. You're on. <laughs> okay. So what, what, what I'd like you to do is <clears throat> I just gave you a little, little talk there about you being a little girl. Could you tell us that story, how, how that happened? Well, I was actually born in Belgium. And my parents, my father was taken by the Nazis three days before I was born. And my mother was taken a few months after I was born. And I have a blood sister and we were kind of passed around under cover trying to save us. And then it didn't work. And I ended up in a Nazi camp called Mechelen. And this man who knew my father bribed a guard there. So one week before my sister and I were to be sent to Auschwitz, where we would have been killed immediately, the, they, they let us go. And I ended up in a series of orphanages, during which time, once again, there was a few close calls. It was just a miracle. And then I was adopted when I was six years old by a family named Cooper. And I came to America, and I became an American citizen. And that's how I happened to be here. Wow, it's just, it's its marvelous to hear that, that you got away and it just, it, I mean, you want to talk about, about a miracle? That's a miracle in my book, okay? Yeah, well, indirectly, I found out about my past through Scientology. What happened was that Tony Ortega, who, as you know, we've just co-written a book together called Battlefield Scientology, and Tony wrote a piece about me for the Village Voice. And it was picked up by a paper in Belgium and another one in Holland. And this man in Holland read it and he emailed me and he said it was my father who paid a bribe and got you out. And he knew enough information about me, for example, my mother's maiden name, which had not appeared anyplace else, that we realized that, uh, yes, so something good did happen as a result of my fighting Scientology. Yeah, I'm going to just uh, interrupt our flow or train of thought here just to mention the book, uh, Battlefield Scientology. <clears throat> I got a copy of it, and I got to tell you, yeah. I have to put it down because I get finished one article. And think, well, I'm just going to try this next one. Next thing you know, I'm reading it, and I got a lot of stuff to do. Of course, I don't like administrative work, and I'll, I'll sit down at my desk and start reading it. So it's a great excuse not to do the filing and the stuff that I'm not nuts about. I recommend anybody who's watching this, or if you're not watching it, well, how the hell are you going to know if you're not watching it? But please go on Amazon and get a copy of the book. Just put in Battlefield Scientology. And if you have a Kindle, you can get it in about 10 seconds or wait a couple of days. I think it's on Prime. You'll you'll get a, a hard copy. It's a paperback copy. It's fabulous book. It's just, of course, to me, it's very interesting because yeah. 
I've followed Tony Ortega for years. Anyway, getting back to your story, um, you you then you you became a writer. How, how did this happen that you became a writer? I wanted to be a writer from the time I was eight years old, and actually, I've since written twenty six books. But my first book was the first major expose of Scientology, and I, it started in nineteen sixty eight. My book, my research, and Scientology was very popular. It was not considered a religion. It was sort of the way Est was in the 80s, just a fun group in which people were having a great time. They had a lot of very attractive women. They had a very free and loose sort of uh, sexual behavior there. And a lot of people joined. There were about 100,000 members, maybe more in those days. But there was a sort of a sinister undercurrent. And I was interested in becoming an investigative reporter. This was the days of Woodward and Bernstein, and that was a, a hot profession. And I never was a Scientologist, but I began researching. I did go undercover one weekend. The Somebody tried to warn me against writing about them, saying that when he had left Scientology, he had gotten death threats. And uh, the person who first told me about it was a boyfriend. and. He joined Scientology, and then he told me that he thought he was Jesus Christ. And I thought, well, that's strange. And then I went to his boss, who he had also gotten into Scientology, and said, you know, he thinks he's Christ now, or that he was Christ at one point. And the boss said, well, maybe he really was. So at that point, I thought, hmm, this is something I need to look into. And yeah, and let me tell you something. Yes. Everybody is Jesus Christ or Julius Caesar or Joan of Arc. Nobody's yes. a slave or somebody <laughs> who works in the fields. Everybody's a famous personality. Yes. You know, it reminds me of the thing that Barnum and Bailey, not who was it now, the one that's the suckers born every day. He had a display of skulls in there, and there was one skull on one line, and it said the skull of Cleopatra. And then about 10 skulls later, another sign said the skull of Cleopatra. And the person said to him, what is this? How come you have two skulls? He says, that was her skull when she was a child. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to business. Well, yeah. So he said, thought it was Jesus Christ. So now, did you go in the org to do your investigative reporting? Or how did you do it? Just for a weekend, I went undercover. I used, in fact, a fake name. And I asked so many questions that they began to suspect me. I also managed to walk away from the group at one point and snoop around, and I found a disconnection notice. Of course, I didn't know what it was then. And it was all about this woman who supposedly had knocked five men down a flight of steps, which I really thought was somewhat unbelievable. And they had her phone number and, and called her, you know, enemy of mankind and all this sort of stuff. So when I tried to reach her to find, by phone, her phone was this was unlisted and i had written down the names of about five people who they had these disconnection notices and they all had unlisted numbers and in those days that was very rare for people to have unlisted numbers yeah. so i wondered you know whether these people might be being harassed which of course now i know for sure they were yeah absolutely so now, how else did you uh, research them? What, what did you? There was no internet in those days. No, it was really rough. Yeah, I had to go down to Washington D.C., where there was a the FDA had seized their e meters, saying that they were practicing medicine without a license, and they had a lot of what was called attached documents, and I went through all of those, and that became the basis for my book. You know, for example. Uh, Hubbard had come up with um, uh, celebrity, uh, you know, to get celebrities in. I forget what the name of the project was. And so I read about that and I started writing about all these different strange things in Scientology. And it was basically a research job. And uh, it's, it is available to this day at free for free uh, at my website, paulettecooper.com. Wow. It's interesting. So now your book comes out. What happened then? Well, I didn't. What happened was that before I wrote a book, I did an article for Harper Queen magazine. And I didn't know it had come out because it was in England. And the, I received a phone call, a death threat. 
And I didn't understand why. I mean, I was writing for places like Cosmopolitan and TV Guide, you know, and hardly anything to kill someone for. Yeah. And that's when I found out that the piece had come out already in England. And probably I should have just quit then, but instead, at that point, I turned it into a book and continued on. And a lot of really nasty things were going on. We found that my phone had been tapped. They were writing my name down on bathroom walls in men's room throughout New York. So I was getting these awful phone calls, as you can wow. imagine. Yeah, these were the days before answering services. So you pretty much had to pick up your phone. And I had more death threats. And there were all kinds of really nasty things going on. The My roommate was there one day when somebody came with flowers, rang my bell, and unwrapped the flowers, uh, not the flowers, unwrapped the uh, uh, holder for the flowers, and there was a gun in there, and he put the gun to her head. And by the way, Joy looked like I did at that time. Uh, we were, you know, uh, short brunettes. And, wow. Yeah, and it was very scary because, uh, you know, it's... It, it I mean, appeared was, this, was this a real gun? It wasn't a toy gun, right? No, we never found... No, it wasn't a toy gun. And we never found out whether or not he pulled the trigger, whether the gun just didn't work or whatever. And she began screaming and it was a small building. Neighbors came running out and he ran off. And the whole thing was very, very, very unusual. A well-dressed black man in the East 80s at that point. And I decided that I really wasn't safe because I was getting these threats and all these awful things were happening. And I lived on the ground floor of a, an apartment building. So I decided I should move to a safer building. So I moved to a place with a doorman and really felt safe and great. And yeah. about a week or two after I moved in, all of the tenants, I think there were 300 tenants in the building, received a, an anonymous smear letter that a woman had moved into their building and she was a part-time prostitute with venereal disease. And it was really, I mean, horrible lies. But the weirdest thing was that it ended up by saying that I had sexually molested a two-year-old baby girl. Wow. And I joked, yeah, I joked with my friends. I said, you know, maybe a 22-year-old baby boy, but not <laughs> a two-year-old baby girl. But the reason for that was that I had told the story in my book about a Scientology reverend who had sexually molested a two-year-old baby girl. And I wow. think they wanted me to know that they had written that letter as if there would have been any doubt. So, and yes. as you know, well, sexual, I, I say it's unbelievable. No, it is not unbelievable. No. It's totally believable. Yeah. It, it is their policy. It is how they operate. That's normal operation. That's not the unusual or the freaky incident that shouldn't have taken place. This is how they operate. And that would be a product of what I call the ideal mind. Now, you hear about all these ideal orgs that they're building, and they fill it up with new air. I guess that's what they expect to get there because people aren't going in it. But they're called ideal orgs, and I have a concept which is the ideal mind. Now, the ideal mind in this case would be to harass you to the point of maybe you wanting to leave the city and never have anything to do with it anymore and lead a miserable life. Put that on you and then feel good about it and feel no remorse and think that you're doing the best for the greatest good of all mankind. That's yeah. another product of the ideal mind. Anyway, right. I just want to interject that because uh, your story is, yeah, it, it borders your un unbelievability to me. All right. Well, not uh, when you know Scientology, but in fact, what they wanted to do with me was to get me in a mental institution or jail so that no one would believe what I said about Scientology. So they developed another plot a few years later, which I didn't know about at the time, called Operation Freakout. And that was to have somebody sending bomb threats to Henry Kissinger, my name, somebody going who's supposed to look like me, going into stores and threatening to bomb them and so on. But I, I'm getting ahead of my story a little bit. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Get back to where we were. We were, you, uh, your book come out and you start getting threats and everything. And then, uh, right. And all these terrible things were happening. And then one day I got a visit from the FBI saying that Scientology claimed to have received bomb threats. 
and named me as a likely suspect. And I knew immediately that it was phony because they had so many real enemies that naming me was obviously just a way of harassing me. But it yeah. turned out to be more than harassment because a few weeks earlier, I had signed a petition. And what I didn't realize was that underneath the clipboard was an empty a, a piece of paper and they got my fingerprint. So my fingerprint was on the bomb threat. And as a result, I was arrested. I was indicted. I faced 15 years in jail, five years for each of the two bomb threats that I didn't write, five years for perjury for going before a grand jury saying I didn't write it. And I went through the most horrible, horrible eight months of my life. Wow. I couldn't sleep. I mean, I faced, oh, I faced jail, but also I had wanted to be a writer since I was eight years old. And I knew this would be the end of my career because no editor was, would give a writing assignment to somebody accused of sending bomb threats. Yeah. And the, oh, I knew it was going to be a big story because it was bizarre, you know, a woman writes a book about a church and uh, then sends them bomb threats. And also, if you've seen the cover of the book that Tony Ortega wrote about me, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely, you'll see that I was very photogenic. Yeah. And, yeah, and that would have worked against me because, you know, a, a single pretty woman is going to be big news. Um, oh, yeah. And it was just everything I'd ever done was going to be in the in the tabloids. And I felt terrible for my adopted parents. And it was just a horrible time for it. Uh, how, could, how could you sleep or eat? I mean, this is a miserable life. Yeah, I didn't eat. I Every day, first of all, I lived on Valium and vodka and a glass of orange juice and one or two eggs every day. That was it. And I went down to 83 pounds. Jesus, God. And I just could not sleep. I mean, if I fell asleep, I woke up for a few minutes. I woke up in icy terror. And it was just the most horrible time. And meanwhile, the uh, legal expenses were becoming astronomical. And my parents had to help me out. In the end, it cost, oh, I think it was $28,000 in legal fees, which would be over 100000 today. And so if you can imagine somebody just in a sense, minding their own business and suddenly having to spend over $100,000 to stay out of jail. So that added to the anxiety. And okay. I couldn't go out. I became very agoraphobic. And Scientology, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a complicated situation, but basically they introduced me to somebody uh, who they called Jerry, and he moved in. And it was platonic. Because first of all, I had a boyfriend, serious boyfriend for over a year who left me during this time because, quote, I was no fun anymore. And mm -hmm. uh, then his boss got an anonymous smear letter and my parents got anonymous smear letters. There were a lot. Of, in all, there were five over the years that they sent horrible letters. And um, anyway, he moved in partially to pay half the rent, but also because I became so afraid of going out that... I couldn't even walk my little doggy. Wow. So, yeah, so he walked the dog for me. And uh, Wait, now, I, I missed something. Uh, you later. said they introduced him to you? Dogs now. Oh, there you go. Hey, <laughs> what's the dog's name? This is Polo, and somewhere around here is Peekaboo. We have hey, two you. Dogs. Hey, there, Peekaboo. Good, good morning, little doggy. <laughs> I love dogs. And that was my first dog, and I really mistreated it because I could not walk. Wow. So, so who, who was it that introduced Jerry to you? Well, it's a little complicated. Actually, it was the woman who had me sign the petition. And we never figured out who she was. I, I wish I knew. And she introduced me to a friend who needed an apartment. And that friend, I got an apartment in that building that I was living in. And then um, she, this was her alleged boyfriend. And then... Mm -hmm. She disappeared because I became suspicious of her. But, you know, I was a very trusting person. It really, in some ways, wrecked my life being so trusting. And uh, she introduced me to Jerry, and then Jerry moved in. And I didn't find out that he was a Scientologist until five years after he left, when 
now I'm really getting ahead of the story. When the FBI raided these the documents of Scientology, and they found them that they had kept weekly records of what they were doing to me. And the first frame up, the one that I almost went to jail for, was called Operation Dynamite. And the second attempt was called Operation Freakout. And there was a diary in there. And I it was saying things like, you know, what I was wearing so they could follow me. And uh, things like, today she talks suicide. And, and by the way, during the frame up, I almost did kill myself. Wow. And they, uh, today she's talking suicide. Wouldn't that be wonderful for Scientology? And I'm looking at this, who could know these things? And then I realized that Jerry, the guy that I was living with, was obviously a Scientologist. And when he went up each night to the roof to get some air, there was a, a swimming pool up on the roof of our building. There was also a payphone, and he was calling in everything about me. And one of the scary things to me also was that on a couple of occasions, he got me to go up there with him. Because remember, I didn't want to leave the apartment. And I went up, and he would jump up on the ledge. And this was 33 stories high. Jesus, God. Yeah, he was a pretty gutsy guy. I mean, I've since found out that he had once been a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, and I have his real name. And he would jump up and he'd say, come on, Paula, come up here with me. You know, show those bastards that you have courage. And... And I was, thank God, I was in such a terrible way. I just kind of huddled on one of the beach chairs. I could not go up. And I I'm just. Glad you didn't go up. Oh, yeah, because I think uh, if I'd gone it up, off. it would have been so easy to just push me over. Everybody yeah. assumed I was, I was talking suicide all the time. They would have assumed that I had committed suicide. Absolutely. So, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. And by the way, the, um, the documents that we mentioned, that's where they discovered that my code name was Miss Lovely. So uh, when Tony wrote the book about me, yeah, yeah. Uh, the title is The Unbreakable Miss Lovely. Yeah. So, you know, my husband jokingly calls me Miss Lovely now. Well, you are unbreakable. I mean, to go through this crap and oh, yeah, still be here with a smiling face and looking yeah. great and talking to me this morning, I, I thank God things happened the way they did for you, kid. I really do. It was a miracle. And the, the one thing, good thing that came out of this nightmare and and the nightmare went on because i oh i'm getting ahead of myself okay when the government dropped the charges and then when i found out what scientology was doing and so on i didn't quit fighting because nobody else would take them on and you have to understand that having written this book everybody was calling me all the time they had nobody to go to if you right. were in la and you called the district attorney John Minor and said, you know, that my daughter, my son, da 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 da. He'd say, I can't help you. They're calling themselves a church, but there's a woman in New York who has a listed number named Paula Cooper. Call her. So wow. I found myself in this position. Remember, there was no internet in those days. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. People yeah. don't understand that somebody had to know everything that was going on. Yeah. And that was me. I knew, you know, who they were suing. And meanwhile, by the way, while I was speaking out, they were constantly suing me. And in the end, there were 19 lawsuits, and I had to defend them on the salary of a freelance writer. In fact, when wow. this was all over, my parents said, if you ever do anything further about Scientology, we're not giving you a dime because we don't want you to. So I had to support all these lawsuits. So that added to the nightmare, you know. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll tell you. Well, see, the thing is, they have a bottomless pit of money that the whales give them. Yeah. So they have nothing else to spend their money on. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, so they sued you about how many times did you say? 19 times all over the world. They even had members whose parents I tried to, uh, you know, what's the word? deprogram them. They sued me saying that because their parents had read my book. Well, I didn't even know these people. So I had to defend myself from people I didn't even know. Uh, some of the suits were because I did speak out. Some of the suits, one sort of bizarre one was they had a, oh, what do you call it? They had some kind of a charity auction for the Celebrity Center in California. And they got a lot of celebrities to donate, but the ce celebrities didn't know that the celebrity center was Scientology. So I called the agents of all the people that were going to donate to tell them that they were donating to Scientology. 
but I goofed and accidentally, I, I did it from pay phones. You know, we didn't have cell phones in those days. Yeah. But I goofed and one of the calls I made was from my home phone to Carol Burnett's agent. And mm. when they subpoenaed my phone records, they found out that as they suspected, I was the person behind ruining this celebrity uh, uh, auction. So they sued me for that. They, they, you know, they, they, you could sue anybody for anything. You know that. I know that. And people sue it because somebody call them a bad name and they're going to never recover from it. I, I know how it goes. But right. we, we were talking, you know, a couple of days ago when we were talking about what we're going to do in the interview. Mm -hmm. and, you, and I just would like you to bring this out because here's an example of how they would handle, quote, unquote, something or, or try to bring about uh, a desired result. Tell us a story about them following your mom to the beauty parlor. That's oh, um, always for years and years and years. They always tried to have somebody on me, somebody that could find out mm -hmm. what I was doing and what other people were doing because I tended to know what was going on. And uh, so they, one of the things that they did is they followed. They had a woman follow my mother to the beauty parlor so they could find out where her beauty parlor was, and then sat next to her and said, it struck up a conversation and said, do you have any children? My mother said, yes, I have a daughter. Is she married? No, she's not. Uh, well, I have a son who is not married and uh, maybe we could fix them up. And we, we found out later that the woman was a Scientologist and of course she was trying to get me to date her son as a way of finding, of getting to me. But, you know, even up until a few years ago, there was a, a reporter for the Van, for Vanity Fair, and we would have lunch together, maybe six months or so. And unbeknownst to me, he was on the payroll of Scientology to talk to the, quote, enemies and find out what was going on. And we all believed him because he was, still is, a legitimate Vanity Fair writer. Wow. And, um, yeah, and I think it was uh, uh, Mike Rinder, but a very nice piece today, by the way, on Battlefield Scientology, my new book with Tony. Anyway, he was, uh, uh, when, he, when he got out, he said, this guy on our, was on our payroll. Mm -hmm. And that's how we found out. So right at the moment, I don't think they have anyone on me, but I'm very cautious. Yeah. yeah. Well, people ask me, do you have anybody following you? Because yeah. I had two PIs follow me when I first got out. Yeah. For 15 months, they're getting paid 10 Gs a week and to report on everything I did or said or from 8 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. But look at this. Look at the chicanery. Yeah. By the way, the story of your being followed is one of the chapters, you know, based on Tony's blog on the story. Well, it, I, I didn't get to that, but I'm looking forward to reading it because. Yeah, yeah. It's in the section called Fair Game. So, okay. by the way, I wrote the intros to all of the five sections. I know. I love your intros. They're yeah. real. I'll tell you what I like about your writing. Yeah. You write stuff that anybody can understand. You're not highfalutin or you don't want to use big words. So yeah. we say, oh, gee, what a great vocabulary she has. What the hell does this have to do? But a lot of writers do that. So I, I read your intro and immediately I go into the first little essay that Tony wrote. And uh, as I say, I, I have to do my despicable work like administration before I pick up the book because I'm good for a little while on that. I, I recommend everybody buy a copy of this. I, I love it. Well, at but, the end, at the very end, I explain that this is the last thing I'm going to write about Scientology. But I also say that I always jokingly say to my husband that when I die, I want to be cremated and I want him to sprinkle my ashes over the nearest org so that I have the last word. <laughs> there you go. This is well. What I wanted to point out here. Look, look at all of the chicanery, the, yeah. the subterfuge, the the covert drives, all brought about to frame somebody. No, we're not talking about. You know, you're going to discover somebody who did some bad things and turn them over to the police. You're talking about lies from the word go to put somebody behind bars. Listen, I have a friend and he's a restaurant owner now, but he spent 15 years 
on the police force. And he's also a private investigator. And he's worked for many years, many years for many attorneys in the Milwaukee area. I told him your story. And he said, Ronnie, in all of the years I've done investigations for these prominent lawyers, and I've done it on every possible thing. I never ran against this, never ran up against a story where somebody was being framed, yeah. actually being framed, mm -hmm. but worse yet, by a church. Yeah. And they're no more a church yeah. than I am an ostrich, okay? No matter how you look at me, I'm not going to be an ostrich. No matter how you look at them, look at what they produce. And you could say they're a church. Well, I guess that's your opinion, but it's unbelievable to me. They're a cult in the best sense of the word. And I think you mentioned about them being like fascists. Oh, yeah. Very fascistic organization. It's one of the reasons that I continue to fight them and expose them no matter what. I felt that they were very fascistic. And I also felt that in the 30s, if people had spoken out more, maybe the Holocaust would not have happened. Yeah. And I felt, therefore, an obligation to speak out against some evil that I knew something about. Well, I appreciate it. And I, I feel very si similar to you. I, I do this out of duty. I mean, I enjoy playing music, but I look forward to this because if I can save some people the heartache that is involved in it, like in the, in your case, because you spoke out and then they came after you and tried to ruin your life and put you in prison, or, you know, with me, they took my family away. Hey, that's a pretty bad thing to do to somebody. And they do it just willy nilly, just like that. Yep. That's a product of the ideal mind, though. So, OK, so now. Did you ever think at any point in your life. When this was going on, well, not at any point, but when it was going on, that somehow it would have a pretty happy ending. No, I Excuse me. I don't think I could see the end game in this whole thing. It was just, it was such a morass, you know, with the lawsuits and everything. And nobody else was coming forward. And I felt that until somebody else came forward, I could not leave. And because then there would have been nobody. Uh, yeah. fighting them. But fortunately, an attorney, a brave attorney named Michael Flynn came along and he announced that he was going to do a class action suit against Scientology. And as a result, a lot of people came out and began speaking out against them, at which point I knew that I could finally think about living my life again, going back to it. And so he took over. Uh, I settled. And two years later, and in fact, and by the way, this was one good thing that happened to me, <clears throat> excuse me, because of Scientology, was that the attorney who did the settlement, invited me to a party, and he also invited Paul. And I had dated Paul briefly when I was young, and it hadn't worked out. And that 19 years later, because of the Scientology connection, where I'm at this party, and I walk in, and there's Paul. And we began dating immediately, and a year later, we were married, and we are the happiest couple I know. I mean, we married 30 years, never had a fight. We do the same things. We love the same things. And that's, that's fabulous. Yeah. And yeah. I really, I have a, a very, very happy life now. I, I tell you, I'm so happy for you. I, I can't express it in words because I don't know of anybody. Yeah. And of course, I know a lot of people. I've met a lot of people in my life because I've done a lot of things. I'm 82 years old. I never met anybody who came that close to death did so much good against the suppression and the harassment and the character assassination that the church pulled on her and come out with a happy win. And I'm happy for you. Very, very, very lucky uh, person. Lucky that I'm alive. I mean, also, I the whole incident with Jerry and the roof, the whole incident with the guy with the gun, and then, of course, the several close calls uh, in Belgium at a time when the Nazis were trying to kill every Jew. And my sister and I both survived. My sister lives in New York, and uh, we talk to each other once a week, even though we were brought up by different families in different countries. And uh, she has two children. And in all the two of us that were two that were killed, my mother and father, there's ten now with all the children. And 
Wow. So e even that has a happy ending. So That's really fabulous. Well, listen, I think we've told a story. How do you feel? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I'd like to recommend that people buy the new book, Battlefield Scientology, and they might want to buy Tony's book, The Unbreakable Miss Lovely, which tells all of, of these stories. And by the way, my husband just wrote his memoir <laughs> called My First 83 Years. Wait, what's um, it called? My First 83 Years. My first 83. <laughs> He's looking forward to the next 83. Is that available on Amazon? That's also, yes. Well, Paul produced the Eleanor Roosevelt TV show. He produced Bishop Sheen's TV show. He brought Dr. Ruth to television. So there's a lot of great stories in that book. And our two books came out at the same time deliberately. And wow. That's yeah. great. Well, that's been My fun. first 83 years. And yeah. it's Paul Noble. Is that his name? Yeah, it's really good. And I, I write uh, now the pet column for the Palm Beach Daily News. And the I'll just end by saying that sometimes people say to me, you know, how, how could you have done this kind of investigative work and now you write about dogs and cats? Mm -hmm. And I say, well, you know, dogs don't sue you and cats don't harass you. It's a much easier, pleasanter life. Okay. You know, take no, there, there's there's oh. nothing like a cat or a dog for it. Oh, yeah. Great Absolutely. loyalty and love and forgiveness, no matter what, they forgive you. Exactly. They, they just, they don't know, they don't know how to hold malice in their hearts. I, I got to say that we had a cat for 18 years in the Sea Organization. She was just a wonderful cat. And then one day she walked outside and died and had a happy life with us. Anyway, so look, so I don't recommend these books. I insist that you go out and buy them. So what, number one is Battlefield Earth? Excuse Battlefield, me, it's Scientology. Battlefield, Battlefield Scientology. Boy, there's a... And the, yeah, and the yeah. subtitle is Exposing L. Ron Hubbard's Dangerous, quote, Religion. And it's got 33 chapters in it. And it's all based on Tony Ortega's blog, the uh, underground bunker. Yeah. And, uh, then the other one, as I said, is the book he'd written a few years ago about my past and my fight against Scientology. Uh, I think the subtitle on that is the How the Church of Scientology Tried to Destroy Paul I. Cooper. So I recommend you do you buy both of them. Well, how about your husband's book, My First oh, 83, yeah. years. 83 Years? That's a fun book. It really is a lot yeah, of it. And there's, like a, there is a chapter on me in it and uh, you know, others, various stories and so on. It's good. Good book. Yeah, well, how could he not? How could he write a book and not have you part of it? Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, my producer is signaling me on something. Go on. He's got one question, Ron. Um, it was actually a good one. Uh, somebody asked, "Did you follow Tony Ortega's blog while you were in, or when did you start?" I started after I escaped from the church. It was impossible to watch his blog when you're in the C organization. Yeah. Is that what'd you, what? Now, what'd you think? What like? When you found it, like, what were your thoughts? What do I think? I read it every day. That That's my news of the day. That's the first thing I do. And I'm, I read Mike Rinder. Yeah. And uh, I see, you know, if we got more subscribers on my site. Because <laughs> you know, uh, I enjoy doing this. And I would like to have it be 10 times as big. And while we're at it, please, if you care to help in this endeavor, and if you don't, that's fine, too. You know, it's your choice. But I would appreciate it if you became a Patreon and you contribute immediately to the ongoingness of this program where I'll continue to bring you people. Oh, listen, I don't know when we're going to have as many people with an unusual, I don't know what adjective to use on the story is yours, but we do have them occasionally. And today we had one. So this is like a momentous time for me. Uh, so, yeah, why not become a Patreon and just help us out in this? I'd appreciate it very much. We have no sponsor. That means I have nobody uh, laying down some editorial rules or what I can say or what I can't say. And I want it to be that way. And I want it to be a platform where somebody can come on, tell their whole story. I don't throw them under the bus. I'm not trying to be some goddamn famous interviewer. All I want to do is expose uh, the abuses that the Church of Scientology commits on people. Anyway, become a patron. Continue watching. Get other people to watch the show. Did you have something to say before we ended off, Paulette? Yes, I just wanted to know what your website is, because actually I'm going to become a Patreon. 
Oh, okay. Go on the website. It's called therealronmiscavige.com. And you have to put in those exact words, therealronmiscavige.com, okay. because it, you may already know this, but the church bought over 500 iterations of my name. And if oh. you put in anything oh. similar to that, it'll take you to their hate site. Oh, and that, okay. shows, that shows you how popular I am with them. <laughs> they never quit. They really no, they never. Quit. Hey, you, I'm never going to quit. Yeah. Well, you think you're they, never going to quit. I know you're going to retire from it, but <laughs> you're a real crusader. And, uh, you know, I appreciate it. You, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing. It takes real close about to do that. And thanks a lot, Paul. Okay, it's thank wonderful you. of you to do what you've done. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye bye now. And this is Ron Miscavige. Uh, Life after Scientology. See you on the next episode.